Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet of ours. Welcome to Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. This is the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society, and I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining the conversation today. The fashion industry, as we've discussed many times, is responsible for as much as 10% of annual CO2 emissions and an immense amount of waste that chokes landfills, rivers, and beaches around the world. Too much of the stuff that we wear is made from oil-based textiles like polyester that just don't break down wherever they, it lands, whether in a landfill or in nature. But Keel Labs, a Morrisville, North Carolina-based early-stage startup, has developed a kelp-based alternative to oil-based textiles. Kelson is a soft, natural fiber that can be swapped into the clothing production system with no changes, according to the company. The result is clothing that is as comfortable and durable as those made with water-intensive cotton or oil-based textiles. Our guest today is Tessa Callahan, co-founder and CEO of Keel Labs. After beginning her career in the fashion industry, Tessa recognized the growing demand for sustainable alternatives to clothing that's bad for the environment at every step in the life cycle. Keel Labs converts kelp into kelson, and the resulting fiber is compostable at the end of its useful life, making it a potentially circular material that we could be proud to wear. Tessa has been recognized as a Forbes 30 under 30 leader, and you can learn more about Keel Labs at keellabs.com. Now let's get to the conversation after a quick commercial break. Welcome to the show, Tessa. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. How are you doing? Very well, very well. Keel Labs is doing some really interesting stuff. And I wanted to start off by, you know, what, what inspired you to think kelp? That's the answer to our fashion problem. Yeah, I um, I have to say I didn't grow up looking at kelp and saying, I'm going to find a way to make a business out of this. Mm -hmm. um, really how it started was, you know, I was uh, working in the fashion and the textiles industry and really saw a lot of the, the challenges that they were facing firsthand mm -hmm. from waste and pollution to lack of viable solutions to complexities integrating new supply chains. And along with my co-founders, kind of just started off by saying what would need to happen uh -huh. and what would what changes need to occur in order for this industry to function in a way that is better and sustainable for the planet's longevity mm -hmm. and so you know ended up kind of doing a sorry for the pun but a deep dive in terms of where things stand now with our resources and what is lacking and so basically came to the conclusion that nothing that's happening on land is really it for us. And if it's not that, what is it? It's the ocean. Mm -hmm. And what what benefits, what organisms, what's abundant, what's available, um, and what's just good for the planet. And that's how we, you know, stumbled on seaweed itself. And from there have just been fascinated and continuously inspired by the, the benefits and the potential of seaweed and just aquaculture as a whole. So Kelson, the, the material you've developed is made set from 75% seaweed. A, a couple of questions about that. What's the other 25% and how does it compare in terms of environmental impact with traditional textiles like cotton, for instance? Yeah, so when we say 75%, it actually is uh, typically greater than that. However, we want to make sure that as we continue, we're really able to separate ourselves from potentially others in the space. So the majority of our fibers is the seaweed-based polymer. Mm -hmm. The small additions that we add to that are naturally derived additives mm -hmm. that allow the, the formulation to function in the processing and in the chemistry settings where, you know, this polymer is now able to perform on a different level uh, than it would by itself. The benefits of that really are that even just thinking about seaweed versus cotton or, you know, synthetically derived materials, its cultivation requires no water. It grows in it. 
Mm-hmm. It's fine. No pesticides, no fertilizers, no chemicals, obviously no microplastic shedding because it's not a plastic. And so off the bat, we're already setting our standards much higher from there. And really a core foundation of our values as a company is to ensure that we do not touch or work with any toxic chemicals throughout that production process okay. of fibers. And so rather than relying on, you know, these toxic endocrine disrupting carcinogenic chemicals that other kind of natural or man-made fibers do, our entire process is clean. So it is a polymer, however, so that requires some kind of chemical manipulation in order to to, to create it. So can you describe the process that, that Kia Labs uses to convert the seaweed into the fiber? I mean, what's, what's it like on the, the production floor? Sure. So basically how it works is that we purchase extracted polymers from suppliers around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, that extraction... Uh, basically functions by taking in raw seaweed. Typically it's dried, um, ideally in the sun, natural conditions. And then it goes through a series of acids and bases mm-hmm. or and or mechanical processes just to basically break apart the various components that seaweed has within it. From there, what we get is this condensed polymer that we take and we mix with you know, our proprietary formulation uh, using water as our solvent. Mm-hmm. And what we then do is extrude that mixture that what in the industry is called a dope through really tiny holes, which make these long continuous filaments it then gets cross-linked and turned into a solid fiber. From there, it gets texturized, it gets cut into staples. So, you know, for those that might not know, let's say you're growing cotton or even with wools, there's in natural fibers, there's a set length for how long that fiber will be. And then it gets spun into yarns and applied into textiles from there. Um, And so what we create are those fibers that then brands and their suppliers can basically take and turn into whatever end textiles and applications really suit their needs best. I'm curious, is it designed primarily for clothing or could you use this for bedding and other materials like that? How does it perform in those other contexts? This is the beauty of fibers. Uh, When we think about the world around us, even just looking around my room right now, Obviously, I'm wearing fiber-based clothing, my sweater, my underwear, my socks, but I'm also sitting on a fiber-based couch, uh, looking at my rug, some curtains, bedding, as you say, uh, the interiors of homes and insulation is fiber-based as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the robust nature of applications, it really is dramatically diverse. I think the best way of kind of understanding this is Again, thinking about cotton and cotton fibers, where those are found. It's clothes, it's bedding, um, but it's also Q-tips. It's mm-hmm. makeup wipes, it's tampons, et cetera. Um, and that is fundamentally the same formula. I mean, it's cotton. And so we are able to be applied in a wide range of things. Certain applications require a little bit more evaluation, maybe modification, um, but we're starting with the, the primary sector, so apparel, fashion, um, but, you know, interiors, as you're saying, bedding is quite similar and adjacent for us. So uh, you mentioned that you don't use any uh, toxic chemicals in the process, but do you have byproducts or any waste that you can, for, for instance, put back into nature rather than dump into a landfill? Yeah, so we're not dealing with a large amount of waste when it comes to our process. And some of the things that we consider, especially as we move into larger scales, are, you know, water recycling systems, Mm -hmm. um, being able to take even waste fibers and put them back into that same system. Um, But as a whole, we're we're really not looking at a ton of waste or byproducts that come out of our process. So you're, you're designing for sustainability from the very beginning, it sounds like. 
Exactly. And that's, you know, core, not only to how we function as a company, but also in our, you know, research initiatives, what the scope of work we can even look at, what various modifications and chemistries fit within that system, because it's a lot easier to start clean and stay clean than to try to work backwards and figure out how to, you know, change something once it's already broken. If, if Kelson is widely adopted, and, and you mentioned you have suppliers from all around the world, how much seabed do we need to be thinking about setting aside for the, the, the cultivation of kelp for, for use in clothing and other textiles? The beauty of seaweeds and really where we currently stand as a planet, why as a company we're so fascinated with this organism, is that it is massively abundant. It's found mm -hmm. on every continent outside of Antarctica. And so when we think about the planetary limitations, it's really challenging for us to say, okay, we're going to, as a company, need more than what is currently being used and or what is currently available. That being said, it's quite a, a complex and evolving answer here because simultaneously there's a lot of new technologies and initiatives around dramatically expanding the seaweed and the, the kelp cultivating and, and harvesting industries in a way that not only promotes kind of the, the benefits that seaweed have for the planet, but that also then require, you know, large volumes to be consumed, which is where we come in to say, okay, you know, you don't just have to throw out the seaweed once it's farmed, we can provide, you know, a valuable product for it to go into. And mm -hmm. so that's something that we're actively engaging with, you know, collaborating, seeing where that's kind of happening and figuring out what are the best strategies? Because just as the planet changes, just as the climate changes, we need to make sure that we're also changing and, and moving with it. Well, that's interesting because, you know, kelp farming is is uh, proposed as a, a very effective carbon sink. So you literally could almost offset the cost of growing this with carbon credits and your material will be almost a zero cost component of, of fashion in the future. That's a really interesting element that I hadn't thought about before we started the conversation. Are you collaborating with organizations that are looking into new kelp farming strategies? Yeah, so we, you know, our, our kind of core theory here is to promote the increase of cultivation and farming within this industry. Um, and so we're actively, you know, in conversations, collaborating, learning, kind of seeing where these industry is going and how we can help to drive that. As with any industry, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to, you know, who owns what aspect of mm -hmm. what credit or what certification, and especially with aquaculture, when things are literally floating away in the ocean, it could be a lot harder to track specifically as it is, you know, with land-based. And so that's something that, you know, not only are we participating in, but plethora of global institutions are really looking into how do we break down this new industry and these new initiatives? And so I think we're going to really be continuing to learn and literally grow uh, when it comes to how we're able to monitor and track and take advantage of these benefits that, that seaweed has, be that in carbon or wherever. This is a really interesting element to the conversation, uh, but I want to I turn to how you, uh, how you got into the fashion industry with the Kelson offer, but let's take a quick commercial break first. We'll be right back. Now let's return to the discussion with Tessa Callahan. She's CEO of Keel Labs, which is bringing seaweed-based textiles, uh, it's called Kelson, to a fashion retailer near you. Tessa, how did you get fashion industry to pay attention? Did you kick the door down and say, hey, kelp is here? I have to say, I'm definitely the kick the door down kind of person. <laughs> However, we basically founded Keel Labs mm -hmm. coming from the fashion industry, but really in actually having quite a fair deal of requests and interest from, you know, massive industry players before we even started the company. And so for us, that was a really strong indication of there's a demand here. 
maybe we should buckle up and take this a bit more seriously. And since then, you know, I, I think we've been really fortunate to be in the right place and perhaps the wrong time, but the right time for us as a company mm -hmm. in that, you know, we have a, the industry is kind of paying attention and looking for alternatives. And uh, they're the ones that are fortunately enough knocking down our door and saying, how can we get this? When can we do this? Yeah. So that's, that's been really great. It doesn't come without, you know, the complexities of still working in a globally diversified supply chain and right. scaling and all things that come with it. But I think we're, it's really prime or evident that the industry is in a bind and needs better alternatives that they're reaching out. Well, we've certainly seen that a, a number of different fashion uh, players have been on the show talking about it. But you know, you had designer Stella McCartney feature you uh, feature Kelson in the 2024 spring show. What kind of impact did that have? Are you getting a lot more calls as a result of that exposure? Our collaboration with Stella was really fantastic, I have to say. Certainly increased not just new requests and new mm -hmm. interest. But I think really fostered the confidence of our existing partners that we're kind of working with behind the scenes. The fashion industry in particular is very much uh, risk averse. Mm -hmm. And so seeing somebody take that first step, put into a garment, it existed, it performed great, no problems, really gives the confidence to the rest of the industry to say, okay, now we can we can really proceed here. Um, and so to that end, it it was really phenomenal. And I think really helped us to validate the reality of the work that we're doing. It's not theoretical. It's here today. Mm -hmm. We're also ready to go. So you also described Kelson as a drop-in solution for the existing textile pr production process. How easily can this be integrated into clothing designs and materials? What, what does it replace that people are currently using? Yeah, so the way that we really look at Kelson and the industry as a whole is one that's requiring a dramatic diversification in the raw materials that they're working with. The monopolized industry mm -hmm. is, of course, not sustainable for our planetary bounds. And so although we look at comparing certain properties and functions of our material, really what we see is the introduction of a, of a new natural um, so typically where, you know, natural fibers are used, basics, basically non-performance filament type of uh, applications is where we're going. And so for designers, they're really able to say, okay, it's about the weight of the textile, the construction, uh, the kind of latter parts of the design process mm -hmm. that they can deploy Kelson within that don't require any changes to their previous practices. And so they so, just get a spindle of your thread, for instance, and replace a, a cotton thread. Exactly. So they get a cone of a mm -hmm. yarn, okay. and then that yarn is uh, knit or woven into, uh, could be a t-shirt, could be a sweater, mm -hmm. it could be a jacket or a pair of jeans, or in Stella's case, a chunky crocheted mirror embellished dress. Um, and so really it is, yeah, replacing those kind of naturally reliant materials, be that, you know, cotton or, or others. So Kelson is compostable. Uh, and and I want to know whether or not that requires industrial composting as compared to home composting temperatures. And, and the extension of that question is, are you working to ensure these materials are actually being recovered and composted in the future? I know you're early, but are you thinking about that? Absolutely. I mean, we're always thinking about a lot of things. The question is, when when is the right time to act on that? But yeah, so when it comes to compostability and really end of life, this is also a really complex topic. Um, and so although we've done a number of composting studies, we also want to make sure that we're taking into consideration the policies, legislation, and kind of bounds of what brands as well are comfortable saying. And so we're really focused on ensuring that we are 100% biodegradable um, in multiple conditions, but primarily biodegradable within a few days in wastewater. And so we've done okay. you know, a number of certifications and tests in that way. The composting world for certification purposes gets 
uh, quite controversial in a lot of ways. A whole interesting other topic. The reason that we're really focused on this biodegradation and lack of ecotoxicity is because of the latter part of your question. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, recycling and take back programs are really key and critical, we also can't rely on our sustainability profile or our, you know, ecological compliance to be on additional parties compliance. So we want to make sure that even if there are no systems in place, even if someone forgets or doesn't care or whatever happens, that we're still following the Earth's natural cycles. And so with that, I think there's a lot of interest in working with brands to think about take back programs, working to educate consumers as a whole, the recycling and end of life compliance is a much more convoluted topic than I think a lot of people give it credit for. Because when we're thinking about our global systems, that means compliance on a local level, which means right. uh, regional infrastructure, programs, education, how is that being um, regulated? Who's involved? And that's happening, you know, in every country, in every city, in every town around the world. That's going to require a lot of coordination between a lot of different parties. I really hope and want to be a part of that societal transition. However, as a, as a company, we want to make sure that the change is happening now and it's still better and then we'll work in the future to figure out how to solve this massive infrastructure and waste system challenge. Well, and and and, and look, Earth nine one one deals with that. We have that uh, database of exactly that information, and you are absolutely right. It, it is convoluted, complicated, uh, local, global, all at one time. And uh, I think one of the things that we're seeing is a, a greater willingness on the part of consumers to pay a little bit more to make sure that something goes back into nature rather than pollutes nature. Do you see evidence of that in some of the uh, conversations you're having with labels? We certainly see evidence that both labels and consumers have a tolerance to you know, pay a slight premium. That being said, I think there's a lot of examples historically and currently that indicate you can have a slight premium, but for longevity purposes and, and business model purposes, we need to make sure that, you know, it's, it's adding the right value yeah. in the right places. And my, you know, firm, and maybe it's controversial opinion too, is that it really shouldn't be on the consumer to solve the problem of the products that are being made on their behalf. Absolutely so, agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. 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 And so I, I really, we've seen a bit of this, but I think both the business models, the kind of margins, the, again, infrastructure relationships that brands, labels, and suppliers have is really where that change needs to be considered and, and happen. Talk a little about the challenges that you're looking at over the next few years as you try to scale up production of your fiber and integrate more broadly into the fashion industry to create that kind of circular environment that you were just talking about. What are you thinking about? To be honest, I really think that our biggest challenges are almost as I was just saying before. It's around coordination of responsibility, participation, and action. Again, you know, we have a lot of interest from the kind of members of the value chain, from consumers, you know, really calling for more sustainable products, being more educated, to brands acknowledging and setting goals around sustainability practices, governments, supply chain members, mills. However, in order for all those things to line up, everyone needs to be on the same page and participate at the same time. And I think that for that to occur, it means that, you know, a company, whether it's ourselves or someone else, that's, you know, not a billion dollar massive corporation can't be responsible for making sure that every change is being pushed through uh, the system. And so we need brands to be, 
you know, really signing up and participating for the long term, not just for one off orders or, you know, marketing campaigns. We need the suppliers to be, you know, prepared to run new materials or try new, um, try new solutions or um, work with the brands to employ new energy systems. Same thing with kind of all of these factors. And I think that that's the challenge that we face now is how do we line up all the pieces at once, get everyone to act at once and get everyone to take equal responsibility. So if that were to happen, what would the fashion industry and Kiel Labs business look like in 2034? Where do you see us in terms of the arc of that journey that you just described? Are we well on the way or is it very tentative? We're certainly on the way. Um, and I think we can see that not just from the level of innovations that are scaling and becoming available or even being introduced to the types and the sectors of brands and even suppliers that are requesting or participating with these new solutions. There's a long way to go, certainly, um, when it comes to enacting them from all sides. But I think that when we look at, you know, 10 years out, I really see the really the light at the end of the tunnel being this mass diversification of raw materials. And that means really seeing new performance benefits, mm -hmm. um, new applications being developed. And I think that when we go and we start looking through our closets in the next 10 years, ideally, you know, my perfect world would be at least that the consumer doesn't necessarily have to be educated in every single change or item or solution. But when they look in their closet, they'd be really surprised not only to find Kelson and Kiel Labs products, but also a diverse range of raw materials that they're that they're seeing within their wardrobes. That's a really interesting uh, view. Now, does that also suggest that fashion will become a lot more local? Uh, it, 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 circular economies are, are more naturally a regional thing. Uh, do you imagine there being more local designers in addition to the kind of global influence designers that we have today? Absolutely. I think that there's many things, again, that really are changing here from mm -hmm. the global suppliers and just honestly material playbook that we're working off of to become a lot more diversified. But then the infrastructure requirements for uh, more localized production and therefore more, you know, localized and smaller designers, mm -hmm. a lot of really exciting developments there. And I think you're absolutely right. We're certainly going to be seeing a lot more of that in terms of uplifting, uh, you know, individuals and communities yeah. to be able to participate in what they're making and what they're consuming. Um, and so I think it's a really this dramatic, I feel like diversification is is the word of the day when it comes to how we make things, where they come from, how they're disposed, what they're used for. And that is kind of the holistic picture that we need to be embedding into the, the textiles industry as a whole. Well, I think that's a, that's a very inspiring vision. And, and uh, I wanna thank you for spending the time. How can folks track what you're doing? And, and maybe if they're thinking about their fashion label, get in touch with you. The best way to uh, I guess, follow follow and track our progress and, and stay in touch is one, signing up. We have a monthly newsletter that's mm -hmm. great. Talk about our progress, challenges, reaching out to the community, um, and also following us on Instagram. You can always send a message there. People like that. Um, and for those that, you know, want to try out Kelson, want to um, give us feedback, want to partner, uh, we have, again, if you go to our website, there's a couple of different things you can choose from in terms of mm -hmm. what you want to talk about and uh, send us a message. We're definitely eager to build community and, and have a chat. Jessa, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. You too. That was my conversation with Keel Labs co-founder and CEO, Tessa Callahan. Kelson, their seaweed-based fiber is available now, and as we heard, was featured in Stella McCartney's Spring 2024 fashion line. You can learn more about Keel Labs and Kelson at keellabs.com. That's all one word, no space, no dash, keellabs.com.
Many of Tessa's comments are valuable to reflect on, but let me call out a few for folks thinking about their role in the sustainable circular economy, whether that's as a consumer or an entrepreneur. Starting off clean to stay clean, as Tessa said, rep represents a unique opportunity and challenge in the fashion industry, which has grown up dirty and wasteful. Starting anew with a sustainable, low, or no-waste production process is the basis for better environmental outcomes and a sustainable, that is, financially sustainable business in the long run. Not to mention that it caters to a new wave of customers looking for clean alternatives to traditional fashion. Kelp farming is a carbon capture business too. One of the challenges in launching sustainable business is what we call the green premium, the higher initial cost of environmentally responsible products. But because carbon credits could be applied before the cost of kelp and seaweed-based materials to the end user, it's possible to imagine new feedstocks for fashion that are not just cheaper, but almost free compared to land-based textiles. And that could make clothing sustainable, durable, and less expensive for consumers. We just need a reliable way to price carbon, and that's a big challenge that we'll continue to track here on the show. Finally, Tessa's comments about the massive diversification of materials and production are really spot on and inspiring. Now that includes the potential for regional fashion brands that feature local creativity and that are distributed locally. That could revitalize not just clothing, but communities. The more circular we get, the more we regionalize the flows of value can become, keeping more money nearer where we live and shop instead of it, it just flowing out to global brands and not coming back to the consumer's community. The question is, how can we enable these local circular and diversified materials to start flowing? And that's also a question we'll continue to explore on sustainability in your ear, so stay tuned. And I hope you'll take a moment to share that this podcast or any of the more than 460 interviews that we've produced on sustainability in your ear. Writing a review on your favorite podcast platform will help your neighbors find us. Folks, you're the amplifiers that spread more ideas so we can create less waste. So please tell your friends, family, and coworkers they can find sustainability on in your ear on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or wherever they prefer to uh, search for their podcast goodness. Thanks so much for your support. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, and we'll be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. 